women matters today in a little bit reduced quantity of women if we are in um, half of of april already and we have uh, how is it called good friday in english good friday on uh, in this week and we were thinking about um, somebody doing a workshop of blues and so she is not here so why not using blues for the holy things you know why do we need to have oh i love bach but why do we need in in in, in europe to have bach uh, uh, oratories and things but not jazz or maybe jazz but maybe not so what is the expression of holiness how do you express spiritual uh, how can i say celebration but before we do that as always the check-in and i would start with the early morning lady in california okay um so i'm i've already been out and about this morning um <laughs> um so the check-in, yeah, that, that was the check-in that, that led to the topic is, is um, for Beatrice. And for my part, I'm uh, just very, very actively now in my, in my practice routine with the violin again after a whole year. So it's, um, it's amazing. I, I hadn't realized how essential it is for my well-being. I, it's, it's almost, someone once called me a masochist for having these long intervals of not playing. And, and this time I really felt like whoever, I don't remember who said it, but whoever said it was right. Um, it's just so, it's so wonderful to play again. And um, the only problem is that I can't play 24 hours a day. So it's just really exciting. Um, and, the, and the music I'm doing this, I'm doing all the works of Stravinsky um, for the violin. And right now I'm working on the concerto, uh, violin concerto, which is a really beautiful piece. And it's very, it, it's very, very difficult. So it's exciting. It's like um, one of my professors in graduate school, my violin professor um, said, I asked him once why he, um, played such impossibly difficult music. He was a specialist in contemporary contemporary music, and um, he said he said some people climb Mount Everest, and he said for me it's it's learning this this impossible music is the challenge. So mm -hmm. I was thinking about him yesterday when I was practicing. So that's pretty much um, what I'm trying to focus on. I have a lecture series starting in two weeks, so I'm going to have to change gears at some point. And tonight, um, the Harvard Book Club is inviting a 93-year-old lady named Edith Ager, I guess Edith Ager, you would say, um, who, uh, uh, um, she's 93. She was uh, in Auschwitz, I think, mm -hmm. and because she's Jewish and um, just a young girl, but she was a ballerina. And so she, um, the, the head of the, of the concentration camp had her perform for all of the officers. So her life was spared because she was a, um, a good dancer. She was just a young girl. Her, the rest of her family, they were all, um, they all died in the concentration camps. But like Viktor Frankl, she came, she emerged um, from the experience with a really strong character. And um, she wrote a book called um, The Choice kind of like Viktor Frankl about how um, it's all a matter of one's choice if one wants to be bitter or if one wants to, um, you know, um, have a positive attitude towards life. And so she, she lives here. And so she came um, a few years ago before the pandemic to talk about that book. We read it and we invited her to speak about it. And she showed us that even at the age of whatever it was then, 91, she could do high kicks. She demonstrated her, her athletic prowess. She's a real character. She's a tiny, tiny woman about under five feet. 
And anyway, tonight uh, she's coming again, so I'm very excited. Um, she wrote a second book called The Gift, which I haven't read yet. I'm going to read it today. <laughs> um, speed read, um, which I'm curious about, which I guess is is her follow up about her life, because because the, the the first book was was about her childhood in the concentration camp and and how she managed to get through. Um, and so this second book is called The Gift, and I guess it's her, like her life philosophy based on her life since, you know, I mean, the next, the next whatever, 80 years, or whatever. Anyway, I'm excited because she's such a personality and because um, she's coming again tonight. And um, so, yeah, so that's my check-in. A little bit long, sorry. But suddenly, what? What's her name again? Oh, yeah. Edith. Um, I can write it in the chat. Her name is Edith um yeah i'll write it doctor oh that's the other thing yeah she um she became a psychotherapist um so it's sort of very much like victor frankel actually um and she knew him she got to, she only got to know him once she was a professional as well and then he somehow heard about her experience and she heard about his well she read his book um and so yeah so the first book is called the choice and the second book, the one I'm going to read today, is called The Gift. Um, but she's still practicing psychotherapy uh, here and um, apparently has a lot of clients. So it's, um, it's pretty amazing. But, but you can see from her that this is joie de vivre that she has. I'll see tonight if she can still do high kicks after. <laughs> after the pandemic <laughs> anyway it's it's very encouraging though to see someone like that who um just you know she doesn't let anything you know destroy her spirit so it's, it's I'm, assuming, I'm assuming the presentation is not open to the public it's just to an invited group yeah it's it's um yeah it's this is our local harvard book club i wonder if i could sneak you in because they're going to they're going to live stream it on Zoom for the people that can't because it's limited tonight in person because of the pandemic. This is the first time, this is the very first time any of us are meeting in person, mm -hmm. um, mainly to honor her. Of course, I hope she doesn't get sick. <laughs> um, but they're going to live stream it on Zoom. But you'd have to. I wonder how we could do that. Um, but it'll be late at night for you, Christine. It's going to be. You seven. figure that out afterwards. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to take time. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's still in in tech. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I won't talk anymore. <laughs> goodbye. I mean, not goodbye, but <laughs> please. Monia, I think Monia was here very early. Oh no, Christine was here. Whatever. I'm sorry. <laughs> Christine, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Monia. Um, just. It's an interesting tie-in to what Victoria was just saying about choice. Um, a couple of days ago, I was um, in my car listening to a radio station and I heard a song by an artist I've never heard of. I think she's local. And there was this one phrase, every choice we make influences our soul or affects our soul. And it was just this repetition in a song of hers that she had written. And it, I, just, I just loved it because one of the things that I think I love about the Enneagram is that the more we know about ourselves and others, the more, oh, well, speaking for myself, I'm conscious of my choices, where I put my attention. And one of the things I've always said for decades is quote unquote, my, it's my quote, <laughs> the only thing we actually have control over is where we put our attention. And our choices emerge from where we're putting our attention. So um, you touched on that, Victoria, and that's just popped right up in terms of a, what happened just a couple of days ago. Um, and just, I was actually driving to a hospital to have my yearly mammogram. So why am I bothering to tell you that detail? Uh, just because in the middle of the process, we all know that's not very pleasant. Um, somehow the Enneagram came up and the, the technician said, oh, my daughter's really into it. And it just reminded me almost everywhere I go now, I seem to be like this little magnet hearing about 
what the Enneagram is doing. And I'm now working with a brand new client who's 84 years old and just discovered that she's a seven from our first session. So now we're gonna follow up and see what it's like to be 84 discovering that you're a seven. Having fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, my check-in. It's the weather. <laughs> it got cold again, but we are really eager to plant. So we bought some lavender and I just like looking at it, it's beautiful. Um, I've been wondering because tonight will be uh, Indiana, the Zoom Saloon, Integral Saloon. And they are talking about Selbstwirksamkeit. So probably translated roughly as effectiveness. And I was thinking, when you said where our attention is, um, the choices we make. So when you become effective in what you intend to do, uh, that's something that goes back to your earliest childhood, I was told, and I read at Google. Um, yeah, and to me, when uh, Victoria said that, the ballet dancer became a psychotherapist. That's probably uh, the only way to really deal with these things you experience at an early age during the Nazi time. Um, it's sort of logical to become a psychotherapist to me. Um, yeah, uh, we are, my husband and I are right now making a lot of choices regarding the next, this coming year about our vacation, whether we still should drive for a couple of hours to there or just be picked up by somebody or whether we want that. And uh, so, there are quite a lot of decisions made right now for me, for us. And tomorrow he's seeing his doctor, his uh, orthopede. I have no idea uh, because his polyneuropathy is, is can't be healed yet. And he has none of the usual uh, causes because they say it's caused by either diabetes, which we don't have, or um, alcoholism, which he doesn't have either, and I even less. <laughs> so I'm really interested what the most recent uh, research has brought on the subject, and if he, if you come across anything regarding polyneuropathy, uh, which is uh, reduced the, the, uh, the, the, you the energy of how, you, how your feet are energized, <laughs> how your feet are energized is reduced and you can measure it. So it is, it, it's, it's a fact, but there is nothing to cure it yet. And I know a lot of people who suffer our age uh, so around their 80s, who have been suffering for quite a long time. I don't know what caused, we don't know what caused it. There are many speculations, could have been Chernobyl or things like that, but I don't have it. That's not on good. And yeah, he is rather tall. He's six, eight or so, or six, or I don't know what it's, six, four, six, I meet the line, six. So maybe this has also something to do with, I don't know. Um, yeah, so to be effective also means taking care of your body and you're according to your age. I don't want to compete with youngers in doing exercises, but I still try to get as much 
exercises I can or feel fit to. And with regard to music, as you mentioned as the topic also, or uh, Holy Week, uh, to us, uh, Holy Week is usually uh, done by reducing whatever we do, reducing food, reducing imp impulses, reducing inputs, uh, watching less television, watching, and yeah, um, and I'm actually, uh, I, have, I had a time about 10 or 20 years ago when I was really addicted to music, and that sort of reduced itself for the past years as well. And I have all these CDs and we have a huge collection of vinyls and we don't listen to it anymore. So I wonder, maybe it's too emotional and we are also trying to reduce emotions. Uh, I couldn't go to the opera two, two, even two times a, a week. I couldn't go to the opera and I have many friends who obviously lack emotion, so they go as much as they can to the opera. I couldn't stand it. It's just too much to me for me. So that's my check-in. Can I just ask you a question? How do you spell the disease that you described? I'll write it into the chat, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so then... Heidi? Yeah, then me. As for the weather forecast, weather um, report, we still had uh, some very cold nights tonight. Very cold. I mean, it's above zero, but it's still cool. So I had to recover my, my uh, lemon trees. And tonight I will still do it. And then finally it should start and I can plant the good things in the garden. Um, I feel I'm now alone for a few days. Everybody has gone away and it feels like a liberation to me. I'm getting back my energy. I was working in, I'm, every day I do grass mowing and to, in the afternoon I also burned two heaps of uh, olive uh, cut. And I feel energetic and again, how can I say, not conditioned by the presence of other people who I have to, to in some way include in my life or to take care for or whatever it is. So I really enjoy to be alone at the moment and it's nice weather. And I see the Judas tree in front of me in this pink color, it's wonderful. Really, and the swallows come come back and are singing out here. So it's really, it feels good. And I actually have forgotten to, that it was the Holy Week because I'm not anymore uh, with the church, connected with the church as I was before, you know, by, uh, as a choir director. So it doesn't really mean anything anymore to me in this sense. Spiritually, maybe, but not church-wise. So... Maybe on, on, on Easter, normally we had, I had a big invitations, many, many people coming, but for the Corona thing, two years, nobody came. And I guess I won't start again with a lot of people and having all this work and, you know, uh, and have them around. And then it's only small talk. And now you even have to avoid certain topics, two of them, Corona you have to avoid and the war you have to avoid. So what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so it's better to, to be alone with a very few uh, close friends and I will have a guest on, on Thursday so we will see how it's going on yeah uh, with the children I did the Matteo's Passion I had them listen to it and we talked about they are very um, how do you say uh, Bible um, savvy 
And so it was interesting also for them. They knew the stories or repeated the stories and then hear the music and how it is set into music, like the rec recitatives, you know, rec rec I don't know how it's called in English, and the chorals and the airs and the choir. And I had them watch that with children singing. So it was, was very nice. And I still appreciate very, very much this sort of music or classical music. I like sometimes also jazz or other musics. We, we talked about blues in the right moment. I would also like it. And uh, actually, when we talked about spirituality and music, I remember when we were at, um, oh, how is he called? In Los Angeles, the colored priest um, who is doing- Oh, right, yes. Who is uh, and it was on my tongue just now. He's uh, appreciated also by Ken Wilber. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, I can no. see him. I can't just can't remember his name. Yeah. yeah and but, his, or, his wife. Well, oh, sorry. Can you tell me what he does? I, I'm not, I don't he know. He has a, a big about. community and uh, his wife is on the piano and he is a very uh, uh, charismatic, oh. uh, a, a colored person. Uh, uh, very Michael, Michael, not Michael Jackson, Michael something. <laughs> oh, how can I forget that? I still see when we went there and assisted in a mess, and it was a huge room, a huge church, and they are all with the music, and it was really good. And he's also, you know, sort of an entertainer. The, he is the how do you call it? The priest, the the pastor. I don't know how you call it in in. Beckwith, Michael Beckwith. Beckwith, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I got Ooh, it. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I like this uh, to to assist in a sort of um, music uh, uh, spiritual uh, event. So, and I know that I, at least in the in the black community in America, there was very much the 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 um, the jazz uh, singing, not the gospel singing, gospels, and uh, we like it a lot here too. But I think we are not really able to sing it, <laughs> and not really able to to express it. And when you see those people sing from the whole heart and from the whole body and then it has such a drive you know I really love that so why not celebrate God or uh, the universe or whatever you want to 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 celebrate the uh, transcendent with every kind of music isn't everything which we are doing music and other things can not everything be used as a celebration tool so what would you use but before we go to that wonderful theme for today i just want to say congratulations on your freedom <laughs> yeah thank you i mean it just, you have your radiance you know you yeah. you it's for two weeks and afterwards so we, we will see what we do <laughs> but you just a burden has left yeah for a moment yeah mm -hmm. and some insight has come wow yeah. Yeah, powerful. Good. Yeah. So, um, Victoria, you are a classical musician too, and you are very spiritual. What is your? No, I think that. Um, well, actually, by way of answering, I'll tell a tiny anecdote um, that many, many years ago when we first moved to the United States. Um, I mean, I grew up here, obviously, but I mean, with my family, with my husband and, and Beatrice, we moved here from Japan and uh, in 2002. And Billy Graham um, was still uh, at that point touring around the country and giving his big revival meetings. And he was coming and uh, to the big stadium here uh, to do a three-day revival program, and um, and we were curious about it, so we signed up to be in the choir, and also to be um, counselors. So, like like at the end of the meetings, the counselors would go down on the football field and um, 
if there were people who had questions or had problems and wanted someone to pray with them or whatever, just kind of to be available. Anyway, um, so the music, apropos of music, was this old time, um, you know, kind of kind of gospel music, but not um, not from the African American tradition. It was it was it was you know whatever white people gospel music, um, but the same. I don't remember the name of the musicians, but they were the same people that Billy Graham had worked with since he started his mission, like in whatever 1950 or whenever he started it. So it was kind of very old fashioned, in other words. And um, but very good, very high quality, obviously, the you know, famous people. And then the Saturday night of the mission was going to be dedicated to outreach to youth. And so that was bring, they were bringing in the top um, Christian rock um, groups for that event. And um, it's, you know, it's rock music, but the, the lyrics are, you know, we're Christian. So I guess that's what defines Christian rock. <laughs> Um, anyway, so the choir wasn't needed for that night. So then, but Billy Graham the night before said to all of us, you know, all of us who were actually like, you know, in the choir and also doing this counseling thing, he urged us, he said, please, he said, I, please come be, to support, you know, to support the effort. And this is really important. The youth are the most important people to reach because they're very disillusioned with life and blah, blah, blah. And he said, but remember to bring your earplugs. And everybody kind of laughed. So, so we went on the Friday, on the Saturday night um, as we had been bidden um, and we brought our earplugs <laughs> and we needed them. It was deaf, even in this huge, huge outdoor stadium, it was deafening. Um, and, um, but Conrad, my husband, who was Austrian, um, who was very old school and he was already at this time, at this point in time, um, close to 70 years old and he had grown up on the St. Matthew Passion and all the you know traditional music he walked in and he was his at first sound you know as we walked in the stadium because they started with music too to get the crowd you know he was totally horrified you know so loud and so you know aggressive and strong and then he lit, said I mean he told me afterwards he literally like heard a voice of God say to him, um, I am the God of diversity. I love it when my people praise me and everyone has a different unique way to praise me and, um, you know, stop judging, don't judge anybody. And it was literally like this, you know, he experienced like this booming voice in his, you know, in his ear, in his heart. So he told this story to people for years afterwards, because he had always, as an art historian, he had always um, talked about how God was the God of diversity. So that was some, that was his own idea, obviously, um, that the, you know, in terms of art, but I thought it was, I think it's a good thing in this topic. In other words, it's, it's, and I think it's true. I think we see from the different, also from the different religions, because I'm studying, as you know, I'm studying Buddhism right now. And I'm, um, I actually just went to a, an academic um, seminar on Saturday by Zoom by a very famous Buddhist, um, Buddhist scholar um, who, and, and in the question and answer period, they were talking about mus the role of music and the arts and how the, the strict Buddhists um, don't want any, any music or art at all. They think it's all idolatry. They want people just to be inside the, you know, whatever the, the emptiness. <laughs> and he was saying, you know, he didn't think that was valid. I mean, it was, it was fine if people had made that choice, but he said, you know, in the, in the tradition for the last 2,500 years, there's been plenty of art and plenty of music, well, not music, but chanting. Um, but it came up as a, a in that's in that context too. So I, I, my say is, um, and also from my own experience, I have to say that being someone who as a child really only liked classical music, um, and a little bit of, well, I liked classic jazz, you know, for tap dancing kind of stuff, you know, the old, old time, um, like, you know, whatever music, um, but in going to churches where there was a, this, this kind of what they call praise music, I find that if it's, it all has to do with the heart. 
So it, for me, it's off-putting to be in a in a, some kind of a church service or a worship service or a gathering where it's like a concert and you have all the the singers and the musicians up front, like like on the stage, and they all have microphones and there's someone doing the the mix in the back and it's and and you can't participate because it's so loud and as you as a member of the congregation you know you can't even hear yourself think let alone sing and to me that's inappropriate because i feel like these events are participatory they're not supposed to be concerts i mean people can play a concert for god fine but i feel like um community is what it's all about in that context so as far as i'm concerned any music um, or any any form, you know, people have their different tastes, like with anything else. But um, oh, last thing I'm going to say, I'm talking too much today. Um, the last thing I was going to say was that when I was a music director at a church um, many years ago, we had a Good Friday procession um, in a beach town here that's mostly like um, kind of a lot, lot of surfers and drugs and stuff. And we did, we walked through the whole town um, with, I, I hired a band to do New Orleans jazz. And so it was the New Orleans, um, the traditional jazz is done at a funeral service. And of course in New Orleans, they, they also have the funeral procession, you know, with the cortege and everything. So we did a Good Friday, like Stations of the Cross out, out in the town on the streets with this, with this traditional New Orleans jazz band and we all um so and it was really beautiful and people loved it it really drew it drew a lot of people to sort of participate or to to at least you know like go with us um and uh so yeah so that's my take on it Monia, well, yeah, you are looking a little bit tired or frustrated so <laughs> No, neither, neither. I was just thinking about when we went to New Orleans and I saw one of those processions and it was quite, yeah, it was quite inspiring. Mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering if eight o'clock is a little late for me, but I'll see. I'll just see if, I, if the light is as it is. Um, what came into my, uh, I was thinking about Victoria a couple of days ago when I watched uh, a YouTube clip uh, called The Challenge about tap dancing. Oh, <laughs> fascinating. Uh, they were rather old uh, black people. And it was just, I think one of them was, uh, uh, what uh, what uh, the one of the red pack? Uh, uh, oh, oh, Sammy Davis Jr. Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah, he was a great tap dancer, and it's just amazing. He never, I never, he never used that when I saw him in the movies, but and all of them were just fantastic. Uh, so I was wondering what made you pick up tap dancing. Because that's really it's yeah it's yeah it's it's a very 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 special uh, faculty you have to a special what sorry I missed that word uh, a special you have to have a special talent for that I believe do you don't you think so well I don't have any talent for anything but <laughs> not for music either. Okay. I do it because I love it. I do it because I love it. Um, I, I'm not competing by any means <laughs> with anybody. <laughs> the challenge is just to like do do it <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Oh, but it's it's just I don't know. I don't, you can watch that clip too. It's called the challenge because a young man challenges the old ones that they just too old to do anything and they just show him. It's really amazing. So nice <laughs> look. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Christine, music and music. spirituality. Um, I guess it's been pretty much grounded in the way that I was raised. 
um, I had somehow, I don't know how it was, but I had a deep spiritual sense and I would talk to God and uh, get mad at God when I was little. Um, but there was no Christian or other denomination expressed in my family. So practically zero. Once in every Easter, I got a new dress. And I would wear it someplace, which it was evidently the church, but there was no information whatsoever about the spirituality of this period of time. So um, I, I'm associated with a number of groups that are founded in um, Christianity, Catholicism. That's how I met you, Victoria, when I was teaching an Enneagram program at a monastery. So I'm perfectly comfortable and love it, but I just have no history of it. And also I was told very early that I was tone deaf. So even when we would have a party and sing happy birthday, they said, shh, don't talk, don't sing. They told me not to sing. So I had no music in growing up and I had no form to express my spirituality. So I'm not much help here on this subject. <laughs> Other than the fact that I, I love music and I had kind of forgotten how much joy I get by blasting out the music so that my whole house is filled shaking with it. And someone recently said to me, you know, there's some research, solid research. If you do this for 15 minutes a day, loud music, whatever it is that you love, but volume up um that it does in great things for the brain <laughs> but the loud part is very significant and something that you love so i've begun to notice and maybe it's just because the seed was planted to expect it to be transforming sure as hell feels good um but I'm afraid I can't really add too much to the conversation about how this time of the year would be manifested because I just haven't, it's a, like a foreign language for me. Sorry, <laughs> you must feel sorry for me that I've missed that, but oh well. Um. It sounds strange to me. We are here in Europe, so at least my, uh, age so closely related to Christianity. Every little village has the church in the middle and um, you just cannot overlook it. And it's the year is separated by Christmas and Easter. So these are the things to look forward. Now, nowadays, mainly people life, love it because they have holidays, but it was not this as a child we, we were looking for Easter eggs, you know, and uh, Christmas, the gifts and everything. So it has a huge significance. There were people who were not in church, but I don't think they could not know anything about it. So I'm wondering how, uh, where did you grow up and how was this? Was this normal in America not to have any idea about this or is it specific for the place you were? I think it had something to do with where my subculture, where I lived, it was a very wealthy area that we weren't, but my friends had staff in their homes and my father was an airline pilot. So we had what we needed, but I, I didn't, honestly, I just didn't know the difference. None of my friends talked about religion, but what's interesting, um, why that is, I don't know. Um, but when, because I've lived for 20 years outside of the United States and a lot of time in Germany and the UK and Asia. Um, and I lived in, in Spain in the middle of a very huge national forest. There wasn't even a gas station or a store to buy groceries. We had to drive, but there was a church and it was really sweet, you know, and we would go on brings tears to my eyes. We would go on Christmas Eve 
and it was usually cold because it was a very poor village, very poor, so there was no heat. And it took some motivation at midnight to go down there and freeze to death. But I've got lovely memories of the people and how they were all very devout Catholics. And the priest was fabulous. He was wonderful. So I have warm associations with it. I just wasn't raised with um, that sensitivity. And you're saying you are not very gifted. I wouldn't say gifted, not very used to do music yourself, but you probably are listening to music. Do you sometimes have this impression when you listen to mu music that there is something that makes you put into awe? Yeah, so that is sacred. Often, often, yeah. often, often, most of the time. Like the song that I said I just heard on the radio. This guitar player with, you know, talking about every choice affects your soul. So I've been deeply moved by music. Um, when I lived at the Esalen Institute, we would go to a, a Nepenthe, which is a famous restaurant in Big Sur, and we would just dance the night away, you know, expressing ourselves creatively. So it's, I can remember times where it's been fabulous, but here where I live now, I, there, I mean, there's a Baptist church on every corner. And it's, it kind of puts me off a little bit. I'm like, can't you guys get together and have one? Because this is a small community, you know? So I, I guess I've tended to see, I've tried to go to different churches to see if I would fit in any one of them. And um, I just, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it, but I just sensed here in this culture, subculture, a sense of falseness. They would see you walk through the door and they practically stomp on you with this false niceness. They don't know who in the hell I am, but all of a sudden I'm their best friend. And it's just because they want another person in the church and it just doesn't taste good to me. So, sorry about that, but. Um, I'm happy to be with you all celebrating <laughs> whatever way that might be um, this holy week. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, um, okay, do you want to ask something? I, let me give the, the question I have and then I give over to you. I wanted to, to know, you said in, in Buddhism there is not much music and the people don't want it. I wanted to ask Monia what her experience is. Uh, well, singing the mantras and the gongs. So this is the kind of music. Uh, That's all. I know in, mm. in, in, in Europe, but uh, Tibetan music wouldn't be mine. All these wow, wow. <laughs> so that's not uh, what really would inspire me. And uh, but I'm, uh, I belong to what we call in German Bildungsbürger. So I was brought up in school to go to the theater, to go to the opera, to go to concerts, to listen to music. And we do have my husband as well and all our friends. But I do have the feeling that this dies with our generation. It's no longer the young ones, they go to musicals <coughs> or rock concerts, but not the way we were brought up to. But with this was something after the war, obviously in school, they tried to instill that in you, that you have the need to have culture and arts. And that's the way we lived all our lives. Um, yeah, this is a different topic, not the, the decay of our culture. And uh, uh, Victoria, it's, you it's are not playing a decay, the violin. It's a change. It's a change. It's yeah, I don't know, because it's, it's sort of you want to have everything easy. Uh, and to, to, to play a little bit the guitar is a different thing than to play a violin, violin to be able to, to play Stravinsky. That needs a completely <laughs> different different amount of engagement and work. 
So there are still I do very, it's... very talented people around, and they did do it. And they come from families where everybody plays an instrument and they play an instrument. So it continues, but the uh, the consumption of uh, art and music, I have a feeling it changes now. I don't know. That's just I think, yes. yeah. That that is another topic which I would love to discuss some some other time, which is I I think the the relationship between education and culture. Okay, I'll write it down. I think you can learn to, I mean, that's my belief. You can learn to appreciate anything and everything from different cultures, from different periods in history, from anything at all with the proper kind of education mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and exposure. And 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 apropos of being tone deaf, Christine, since we're talking about music today, um, that is, is a huge evil myth um, that has been propagated. Yeah, Heidi's nodding because Heidi was a choral director and a singer. Um, I the, the most exciting day of my life probably was having lunch with Yehudi Menuhin at the British consulate in Vienna. <laughs> um, I mean, I wasn't the only person at the lunch, but but we had a talk because I cornered him at one point. Um, and he said to me that he started his whole school in England um, on the, which is, you know, famous for strings, but he said he started it not for that reason, but because um, he's he was of the firm belief that everyone could, everyone could be a musician, Every, that it's a human gift everyone's born with it and everyone can sing. It's just a matter of exposure and training. And some, some are more natural, yes. Some can sing you know, from the outset with no problem, just like perfect pitch, those are gifts, but everyone is, um, so that's been a great disservice to our whole culture that um, the tone deaf thing, because it's, I mean, yes, if, if, you, don't, if you don't cultivate it, then, then you can't carry a tune. Well, uh, but, um, my children and the grandchildren in particular, they all, we all started them out on musical instruments. And then they went to music school and there they tried to drill them to perform in public. And they all refused. Mm. So they didn't want to perform in public. They, uh, they have their own, they play for them. But I played the piano, but uh, and we were rather disappointed by the programs they have at the music school in Vienna. I mean, that's the country of music, and and they don't. When you go outside of Vienna, in the small villages, they have usually have a band there, and a, uh, they play uh, the trumpet and the marching bands and. So they, they really uh, uh, promote that, but in Vienna, somehow uh, it's amazing. We, but it's, it's not, it wasn't just one child, it was all three of them and my daughter and my second daughter. They just, uh, yeah, they refused to, to perform in public. That's yeah. the... I can understand that because that's not why you should um, get occupied with music. Yeah. Yeah. And to Christine, I wanted to say I, I had several people who thought they were tone, tone deaf, deaf. And then uh, I, that's a lot of work to get them on pitch. But I wanted to say what the reason for that is, because we know from children development that uh, more, more or less with 12, they start to want to become part of a group mm -hmm. and to want to adjust to the group. And when somebody has not automatic uh, the, the tone uh, memory uh, and gets a, a pure um, uh, pitch, they children want to sing and they sing and then they are out of tone, but they don't care because they just want to express them, the singing. And when you let them and don't mm, stigmatize it, then with 11, 12, they start from alone to want to sing the same thing as the others do. But when you start with six or even earlier to say, stop singing, you are not good. Then they miss all these years of, of, of practice practically. 
and then they have this thing written i cannot sing on their on their breast and then later when when you are adult it's so much more work because you you lost all these years of of freely singing and uh, uh, naturally adapting to to others and for me it's really horrible what we are doing in in schools well now really that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking uh i had to decide whether i wanted to do music or paint and mm -hmm. draw we had to decide that in school and my my grandchildren even still have to decide whether they want to go and that's ridiculous yeah. but that's our yeah yeah i remember and i was rather good at drawing as well so and i thought well i'll play the piano so my i was educated by my aunt trained by my aunt who was a singer ah yeah but it's a shame that you have to decide which way which kind of art you want to practice and that's ridiculous but you need in school to do mathematics and physics and chem chemistry and everything all these things you have to do when it's about art you have to choose only one from all of them mm -hmm. Where's the balance? But Christine, you wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just appreciating so much that we're talking about children and the arts. And fortunately, when my son was just in first grade in the UK, in London, um, all the teachers required the students to play the recorder. It was an inexpensive item for them to all have. And my son loved it. And the teacher came and spoke, asked us to come in and said, your son is gifted. He's got a natural, what's the term, embouchure? Embouchure. Embouchure, yeah, the way, his, the way his mouth, he, she said he could be great. He just does it. And I, I mean, fortunately, um, my husband, his dad had a great feeling for music. And so, he took, when we made our next move, um, they went shopping to see which instrument was he drawn to. He kind of wanted the saxophone, but he wasn't big enough for that. So they started him with the clarinet in, in Heidelberg. Hmm. So we had teachers in Heidelberg. And um, ultimately he was at the conservatory and he became, he was only like, he was like little you know, like eight, he became the first chair, clarinet. And there were men over 50 who've been doing it all their life. So it was wonderful to watch him be nurtured. If we had been in the US, I don't think that would have happened. Is he playing, st still playing? Is he Sadly to say, he, I think it, you know, he went off to Georgetown University and fell in with a group of people who, um, where it wasn't cool to play the clarinet, mm. the subgroup, it wasn't cool. And so it, um, you know, we've kept his clarinet and every now and then we say, come on, you know, let's pull it out. But I, he's lost interest. Mm. But he, he and his wife, they both, do encourage a lot of music. I mean, she plays the piano, she plays the guitar, and so he's being exposed. My grandson is being exposed to it. He's just six years old right now. So we'll make see. sure he sings. Make sure he sings. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I um my koi is has got a, a great ear, so I think there's hope for it. But I haven't we have FaceTime every Sunday. I think I've told you all that before that we spend two hours together. And I, I notice the things that we play that he, he always gets to decide, of course, you know, so I'll do, I'll do whatever handstands he <laughs> needs to be made, right? To keep him interested, but it's never been, it hasn't been music so far. Yeah. yeah. I just noticed the time I have another, um group that starts well they start five minutes ago <laughs> anyway um let's yeah to be continued and um i think that i think a lot of subjects came up from today actually on many levels it feels very so, hard um, it feels very good, you know yeah a very heart-based conversation i i just have one thing i want to say to you 
oh, sorry. I just have one thing I want to say to you, Christine, before I um, go off that the, um, I know what you mean about the church. And even for me, and I'm very devout, when I go to a new church, I always feel very conspicuous and it makes me nervous that, you know, I don't want to be like mobbed by people on the same, but by the same token, I don't want to be ignored. I, I always feel very put off when not a single creature says even good morning or sm smiles at me. That seems very unpleasant too. But, um, but I thought if, if you think of it in your own mind as like what I've experienced with these Buddhist sanghas, that, that the welcoming is not the desire to proselytize. I mean, Christianity gets a bad rap for that, understandably, but rather the sense of community and fellowship that it's um, cause all these Buddhist groups I go to everyone, you know, greets each other with such exuberance and everyone's so happy that people are here and we're all together and we're all going to meditate together. And, um, and I think to give the benefit of the doubt, like that people genuinely in, in churches that are, that are, that are outgoing, they genuinely are glad to see a new face and to get acquainted. So just not, not think of it as like a, a kind of, um, you know, like, Trojan horse, you know, evangelism or something. But of course, it, it depends on the community. Anyway, I have to go, but I wish all of you a beautiful week and safe travels, Heidi. I don't know. Oh, I'll see you in the German group. I'll see both of you. Yeah. So Christine, lots of love. Have a good week and um, see you all soon, I hope. Well, tomorrow. Uh, all right. <laughs> Auf Deutsch. <laughs> Let's do a short check out about what came up for you and what is the, the takeaway. Um, do you want to go? Do you want to go, Monia? Do you have something to uh, say? No, I was just because I wrote to Victoria that uh, the Holy Week is about reducing. Lent is reducing. Reducing. So you can digest things better when you eat, mm -hmm. eat less and when you watch less workshops. And she said, well, maybe. And then she sent me, I think, 10 emojis. <laughs> 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 Your favorite thing. Seven, and I always say, "Well, that's a seven. <laughs> um, yeah, but maybe the relationship of education and culture, uh, and the changing of times is is important as well. We also maybe we have we have another topic. That's what I'm taking away. Thank you. I think if wasn't for what you all know from your own history, where you've lived and were raised, that you've got something in your blood. It's the DNA that's subconscious, that's huge, that, um, that I don't see that very much in this culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't feel it. I think I have something in me from the years. Hey, Victoria, I... you're back. You should go to the other. <laughs> I I went. I forgot. I just remember when I got on there. I'm I was alone. Um, they weren't. They're not meeting this week. I forgot. So here I am. I'll, I'll be quiet though. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll just finish, I'll just finish this thought. What was I saying? Um, just I think if it hadn't been for those you know, 20 years outside of the US and most of them in Europe in different cultures that I, I wouldn't even understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It hadn't have been that, mm -hmm. that you were raised with an appreciation for being a human being that I don't think happens around here. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, we definitely have to talk about that. About, about cultural, cultural differences and mm -hmm. uh, appreciation of us in the world, you mm -hmm. know, and what is the means. For me, music is always a means for appreciation and ex appreciation of life and expression of life. So, yeah, that's well, what I take that. away. That's a huge and, takeaway. It's a huge yes. thing. Yes. I, think and I do appreciate the music. I, I listened so yesterday or the other day, I listened to a recording from Claudio Abado, a director, with uh, Daniel Barenboim doing Brahms piano concert. There were moments, you, you know, it's breathtaking. Mm -hmm. 
mm. there and the silent moments not these uh, loud moments but in between how real artists can can lead you into a, I, I almost want to say a different world but in an emotional state which is unprecedented and which you cannot even describe because you have to feel it there is no words to to to, to talk about it but it's always wow so well one of my fondest memories is sitting about uh, two or three meters next to Welser Most, which you probably know, which you should know. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was uh, directing um, Tristan and Isolde. And it was sort of, I was just looking at him. It was, you could feel all the music in him. And what well, it takes about uh, three hours, Tristan and Isolde just and I mean, one hour was, it was one hour less for me. I was just like, what is, 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 is part. So it was so feeling a conductor, I, maybe his energy was just, uh, I didn't even look at the stage, I just looked at him. It was just, uh, and we were sitting first, first, uh, first row. So I was rather close to the stage as well. And, to see how the singers reacted to him. And it, oh, it was just, that's one of my, yeah, mm -hmm. one of the star uh, music experiences I had with a friend of mine who unfortunately died two years ago. Well, so far for music. <laughs> Thank you all for helping me have Thank memories. You. Memories of the Vienna Boys Choir in London. Mm -hmm. I'm on a traveling mm -hmm. you know, concert. I took my son to that. You know? And I keep the other memory that you all have helped me remember is in Ziegelhausen, where I lived outside of Heidelberg. I just would hear the church bells ringing. Mm -hmm. Well, we can listen to church bells here too. Yeah. <laughs> we hear them. We don't, have the, we don't have them here. Uh, yeah, well, we are lucky. You are fortunate. <laughs> Thank so you. Have have a good week of less and less and less for having afterwards abundance. Okay. Right. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Take care. Thank you. And Thank stay you all. Oh,